I always say that you're going to be way further ahead if you can find simple things that you can actually do consistently rather than trying to achieve super hard things that are complicated and time consuming. The barriers of complicated and time consuming will get in the way. Keep it simple. Keep it to things that answer the questions that you care about and, and, uh, and, and do the simple things well. I think that's, that's a coaching rule a sports science rule that, you know, will stand the test of time. It's one of the reasons why I still come back to like, I mean, you know, when I see, when I see people trying to recreate, you know, co super complicated movements in the weight room, trying to achieve this idea of transfer from the gym to the sport, and you've got all these crazy things happening, you know, it just doesn't resonate. It's not that it doesn't work. I mean, who knows, maybe it does work really well. I just think you need to go back to what Derek Eagley said when he got that speed skater, man, I'm just going to start with one thing. I'm going to see how that works. And then when I have a problem, I'm going to add one more thing in. And that's a very different way of thinking that starts simple and adds things in rather than starting super, super noisy and trying to strip stuff out. It's really tough to understand things when you start noisy. That was Dr. Matt Jordan. And you're listening to the just fly performance podcast. Thanks for being here with us today. A lot of times when it comes to the process of training athletes, the process of working to become the best that one can be in a given sport, it's very easy to fall into traps of complexity, making things more difficult and complicated than they need to be, or putting more noise in the system so it's really hard to tell if what you're doing is really working or not. I've certainly been in this situation myself many a time. And it's that type of situation that makes me thrilled to have Dr. Matt Jordan as our guest for the show. Matt Jordan is a strength and conditioning coach and performance consultant for elite athletes with six Olympic cycles of experience. Matt has consulted with more than 30 Olympic and world championship medalists and provides expertise to high performance organizations such as the NHL, the NBA, the NFL, and the military. Matt is currently the director of sports science at the Canadian Sport Institute Calgary, and he also leads the sports science sports medicine program for Alpine Canada. On the show today, Matt is going to be talking about a few things in regards to good training practices, but some elements that we're specifically going to get into are Matt's thoughts on periodization, planning, and training organization. He's going to get into ideas on reducing the noise in a high-performance system where we have multiple cooks in the soup, so to speak, so where you have a sports performance coach, a team sport coach, a strength coach. Matt is also going to talk about vertical jump profiling, how it fits into the bigger picture of an athlete's sport, and how its measure of performance fatigability is different than the performance metrics in sport. Overall, this is an awesome show by a guy who is practical, results and data driven, and has tons of experience working with lots of great athletes and coaching systems. I'm excited to get this episode rolling, so let's get on to it. Episode 202 with Dr. Matt Jordan. Matt, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here today. Oh, I appreciate it. It's been uh, it's been a while. We've been trying to connect here for a couple of years, so it's fine. Nice to finally have a chance to have a chat and uh, and to uh, to do the interview. Yeah, it was it was crazy how when I was looking at the questions, yeah, how how long ago I wrote them. But you know, it's I, it's great that we're able to finally connect, given uh, probably circumstances that have freed up our schedule in interesting ways. Um, at least totally. for yeah. for uh, the element that we're in right now. So. Okay, let's let's get on to it. Um, well, so periodization, that could be a whole show in and of itself. Um, but for just for the sake of, of this talk, uh, you know, it's usually defined as a planned and sequential overload with phases and each one's complementary. And it's taken the model has taken a lot of criticism. And so what are some positives and negatives to the traditional model of periodization? And where might you see it heading? Um, well, I mean... E I'll be honest. I'm I'm a I'm a I'm a pragmatist when it comes to this stuff. And and um, you know my background was um, when I was an athlete was uh, I was an endurance athlete. I was a triathlete, believe it or not, in my teens. And it was probably the one sport I think if I had a chance of having done something good, it would have been that. I was a competitive swimmer as a kid, so I was a good swimmer, and I had a, you know I was actually a, a good runner, so I um, had a couple of important uh, skills there for for triathlon. But the other sport I was doing was speed skating. And, um, so it's kind of a dual sport. This was through high school and, and speed skating is what brought me to Calgary. And when I showed up in here in Calgary, I was at the Olympic training center and 
um, I was very fortunate in that I was um, coached by a Dutch uh, Dutch coach. Uh, she's from the Netherlands uh, and had been a very high level athlete herself as a speed skater. And I was also had the opportunity to kind of get this uh, mentorship through a guy named Dr. David Smith, who was our lead sports scientist and exercise physiologist at our training center. And so when you ask the question about periodization, and I realize there's lots of criticisms around it, but I know firsthand um, the the two bookends. So let's take bookend number one, which is just, it doesn't matter. Like you, you have, you know, strength training, and I'm going back to me as an endurance athlete, strength training and uh, interval work and capacity work and, you know, speed work and acceleration work. None of it matters. Like you just literally just have to fit this in whenever. And, uh, and the whole value proposition that I will be uh, at my best physical performance at the competition uh, of, of interest when it counts, that that will, you know, that, that, that will occur, regardless of whether or not I organize it or if I just do it. I mean, obviously that bookend makes no sense, right? Like you, there's no way that as, a, as an athlete that I could have just randomly selected the same volume, the same intensity, the same type and the same load of uh, training and done it in whichever fashion I wanted and achieve the same result compared to if I organized it a bit. And, and one of the great examples I have, it was when I was doing my master's in exercise physiology uh, and muscle physiology. And I remember I was a guinea pig for one of our exercise physiology labs where we were doing a, a maximum lactate steady state test, an MLSS test. And um, I was a guinea pig. And, and that morning, it, so this is kind of the, the, the dichotomy in my life. As soon as I hit about 18 years old, I got super into strength training and I, and I kind of stopped. The endurance athlete years were really kind of like maybe 13 to 18. And then I sort of transitioned out. But at this point now, I'm, I'm uh, heavily involved in weightlifting and competing in weightlifting. I'm now in my mid-20s. So endurance athlete is a, a deck, you know, seems like ages ago. And um, that particular morning, I'd gone into the gym and I'd done a very, very heavy lower body workout. I'd done, you know, a whack of power cleans and a whack of front squats. And then I had a quick, quick, uh, quick recovery shake and, you know, ran up to the to the lab and started the started the bike ride. And, you know, the whole point about uh, the test that I was doing, one component of it was I had to get my lactate up above a certain threshold. And, um, I can tell you firsthand experience that when I s stepped on the bike and I started pedaling, um, I was working my ass off and I could barely get my blood lactate over three millimoles, which anybody will know on the, on the call that's, you know, that's below most people's anaerobic thresholds. And the problem was I had so much neuromuscular fatigue from my power clean and front squat workout that I, I couldn't get the intensity that I wanted in my in my interval or not in this case, not interval, but this case, the, the test that we were doing for, for the purposes of the lab. So that was my first real lesson on the notion that sequencing and interference effects are real. And, you know, with that said, um, I would argue that yes, periodization theory has achieved, you know, it's, it's, it's um, received a lot of criticisms and fairly, right? Like it's a theory and theory should be that, you know, um, theories are about predictions. Like that's kind of the, you know, if you, anybody who's into the, the philosophy of science will know that scientific theories are there to make predictions. And when predictions are, um, the theories cannot make accurate predictions. Um, you know, we're sort of setting ourselves up for what's called scientific revolutions where old theories get replaced in part or in whole by new theories. And I would say that, uh, periodization theory probably has received, um, important criticisms, but there are some basic principles for all coaches out there to understand that we know that just simply randomly doing exercise uh, is, is likely to be less effective than if we're aware of how we sequence and, and organize training to achieve some outcome. And uh, I guess that's a long winded to say, winded way to say that I, I'm going to sit on the fence to answer your question. I a, believe in challenging th scientific theories and I understand that uh, scientific revolutions happen all the time and we could be sort of in the middle of this. Um, there's really not a good date, a lot of good data to support periodization. I would say there's sort of like, you know, spotty data. It's, it, there is some, but there's also, you know, maybe, maybe for real world, um, uh, users of it there, maybe it's just not strong enough evidence, but I think that as anybody who's done this in the real world on a practical basis, we understand that the sequencing and organization of the training stimulus and things like interference effects are very much real things and therefore require some thought, which is kind of the 
cornerstone of the idea of periodization um, in my mind. So a uh, lot to be learned, but I, I, I also feel that, um, uh, you know, a lot to be questioned, but I also feel that there uh, is a value proposition there that, that is both important and needing uh, attention. So I'm not dismissive of it at all. Yeah. First, I, I think it's interesting that you were an endurance athlete and then you're kind of bitten by the strength bug. And oh, I, yeah. I try to think about how many athletes, uh, I mean, it's such a, it's such a, it's such a different paradigm, right? It's like you're, you're slogging, slogging yeah. miles and then all of a sudden it's like, oh, I get to lift and be, you know, be strong. It's a, yeah. I mean, to be honest with you, I just love to train. Like I, I was, I was an odd kid in that sense that I was, my, my mom, my mom said that they, they brought me in to see if I had a, you know, hyperactivity disorder at the time, right. Is what they would have called it. And the, the physician, I remember him, Dr. Kardash, uh, this guy, it's hard to believe I can remember his name, but I remember him saying, you're not hyperactive, you're hyperkinetic and, and you just need to move lots. And so I was that kid that had to be on the move. And I'll be honest with you. I just love to train. So I was like, the reason I liked endurance sport is because I was exercising and I loved, even in that time, I loved doing strength training. So it's, yeah, it's, it's a funny world though. Hey, cause I can remember distinctly you know, transitioning from endurance athlete to strength athlete. And I never touched the bike again. I just sort of, uh, abandoned it, got the strength bug. So yeah, yeah Sorry, I, I, I sidetracked you there. It's all good. Probably happens quite often. I, and I, I, yeah, I thought it was interesting. I did have a follow up on what you were saying with the periodization model and the ideas. And that's, you're talking about noise and interference and I've, you know, I've, I've seen all the different charts and it's like the Soviet stuff. Where it's like this, we did it for like a jumps train. It's like this volume of jumps and this volume of barbells and yeah. this volume. Of, and you get more and more variables and there's more things like you said that can potentially interfere with each other. And then it really comes down just to, well, the training day and how did you design a list in the training day or the training week? And, but I also think about, I mean, the easiest way we periodize, periodize and it, your, your history and your roots was in endurance. And it seems like if you were just, maybe just a, you know, a run, an endurance runner and one who wasn't even doing anything else. Like I guess you could imagine the Kenyans or somebody who just, just runs sure. and that's it. And, and, or maybe it was similar with speed skating. I don't know how much resistance I'm, I'm not familiar with speed training and how much weight training that they do, but mm -hmm. just someone that where there's like no noise. Um, does that, does that, does there become a profound change as soon as you get to maybe a more of a singular element, like a distance runner where they're not doing anything else? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I think so. Right. And I, and I think that, um, you know, one of my, one of my, one of my, one of my good friends, and I would say, uh, people in the industry that I really look up to and, and definitely always like always am a very, very attentive listener, even though I've heard him present a zillion times is Derek Evely and, uh, Evely and Derek, Derek Evely is, um, He's a Canadian, but he is best known um, as uh, sort of a throws coach uh, and a guy who have he's had Anatoly Bondarchuk, you know, live live basically live, live with him for for I mean I don't know how many years, but long long time, and so Derek's become the closest sort of I would say most in terms of proximity the closest person between the rest of the world and Anatoly Bondarchuk and. You know, what I've always found amazing is um, uh, Bondarchuk has what he calls these reaction curves for throwers. And, you know, by, you know, measuring the thing that matters, which is throwing a shot put um, and how far it goes and, and, and having this done sequentially week by week by week, he's able to develop these reactions to training that are uh, helping to inform the process of training and adaptation and input. And, and very much it's interesting when you listen to Derek talk about how that works there is very, very, very little traditional periodization theory that comes into that. There's a, there's a uh, sequence of workouts and a number of sessions that, the, that they use to expose the, the thrower to as they lead into a competition. And then working back, they know what that reaction curve looks like so they can plan a 60-day cycle or a 75-day cycle or whatever. And I've always found it really interesting that how Derek thinks about training is um, really, really different than the average person. And I'll give you an mm. example because it's going to answer the question, hopefully specifically. You're a speed skating coach. And so what do you do? Well, number one, you're informed by tradition. And if you think about the sport, um, you know, back in the 70s and 80s, there weren't indoor rinks. So you got ice in November when it got cold outside and you lost ice in March. And so a lot of traditions built up in the sport, which were, were, were essentially a cross training like you. In the summer months, you, you, you would do these exercises called imitations, which are 
kind of like mimicking skating, but you're on dry land and you're wearing shoes. Um, they would do things like slide boards and, you know, ditch workouts where you jump side to side in a ditch to mimic the skating movement, tons of cycling, lots of hill sprints, lots of resistance training. So a very big cross training type program from, you know, essentially when the snow melted till when you got ice again. And, um, it's interesting when you, when you look at, um, when you look at speed skating as it trends, as it goes on through the years, um, even when they started to get covered rinks. So now you've got ice that's available for the full year, you know, uh, from, from 12 months of the year, 365 days a year, a, uh, a lot of coaches were, were really, um, resistant to actually skating a lot. And so they kept a lot of their traditional viewpoints of preparing a speed skater with notions like, well, skating athletes can't skate too much because it will, uh, lead to burnout or lead to fatigue, uh, uh, like the maladaptation, like all kinds of crazy notions that as a, a sports scientist or an exercise physiologist, you're like that just doesn't even make sense. And, you know, they were primarily being informed by tradition, by history. And I can remember Derek Evely now starting to work with a speed skater in his area uh, where he lives. And he called me up and he's like, hey, Matt, you know, I got to talk to you about this speed skater. Cause I know you've trained them. I used to be the strength coach for the Canadian national team for many, many years after, uh, actually after I quit the sport, I, I became the strength coach for three or four Olympic cycles. And he's like, I need to pick your brain on how to train this speed skater. And I was like, Derek, I think it's the worst thing for me to do is to tell you what I think. I think you should just do it the way you would do it coming from your background to see what you come up with. And he was so interesting. He was like, well, I'm keeping it super simple. These are the index workouts that we're going to have in a week. I figure I'm going to try this for six weeks. And uh, once I get her reaction curve to this, then I'll layer one thing on. So it was very interesting that you coming from a, a guy back to your, your parallel with the Kenyan runner uh, marathon runners and endurance runners, a very, very simplistic, non noisy approach is what he gravitated to. And if you had taken a speed skating coach and dropped them into th training a thrower, I guarantee you that they would have come up with a very noisy approach. And, um, I just think it, it sort of speaks to the fact that in all disciplines, whether you're a teacher, a physician, um, there's a very, very big struggle to override um, your experience and the way you've always done things, like what has been habitual, what's, what's your like, what's your go-to based on how they, how they trained you, you know, and that's what ends up becoming what you do on a day-to-day -day basis when you're actually coaching is you just rely on your experience rather than a data-driven approach, which even though uh, I realized uh, throwing a shot put might be easier to quantify than, um, you know, maybe some other more complex sports. Um, at the end of the day, I think the, the premise is the same is that we want to be able to measure the things that matter, change the things that matter and understand the minimum effective dose. You know, like what do you need to give somebody in order to get the adaptation? And um, I would, I would think that if there's one problem in today's world, it's that, um, I see it a lot when I teach at the university because I teach at the uh, University of Calgary. I'll ask um, students to prepare programs and come in and present them. And the programs are very noisy and there's lots of stuff in there. And if I ask the student, like, why do you have this exercise or these series of exercises? They usually say, well, I, it's kind of what I see on the internet. Like I, I, it looks good. It seems to make sense. I see lots of people doing it. So I, I decided to put it in there. And, and I try to get them to reprogram that thinking to get down to the idea that you got to figure out what the training effect is that you're trying to achieve and prescribe your exercise very specifically to achieve that goal. Um, so, yeah, kind of roundabout way, it's interesting that, you know, these non-noisy sports, as you put them, I like that terminology. Um, I think there's a lot to be learned there. And, uh, and hopefully we'll uh, circumvent some of the traditional um, uh, sort of hand-me-down uh, ways of doing things. And I use the example of speed skating that driven by weather, right? That shaped how people train for decades, even after they didn't have weather issues to contend with. So it's an interesting thought for sure. I wanted to take a quick break from the show to share with you a little bit about what our sponsor simplyfaster.com now has available in their store. You hear me mention in the outro of the show all the time about the free lap timing system in the K-Box, which I have and use regularly. But today I wanted to share a little bit more about the bar speed monitoring units that Simply Faster has, which is the Gym Aware and the new portable Flex unit. 
So let me start with the gymware. I mention it regularly on the show. It's been referred to as the Cadillac of bar speed monitors. Carl Valley calls it a lab inside a lunchbox, as the readings you get out of the gymware go well beyond typical concentric or just up the up phase of the lift velocities. Rather, you can measure the entire shape of the barbell lift in terms of eccentric velocity, range of motion, and total work done. Total work being awesome, by the way, especially like comparing a long-armed bench presser or a 6'10 squatter versus a 5'11 point guard. So you're getting all these extra metrics that you're not getting on other units. It's perfect for teams wanting to manage the weight room, and the data synchronizes to software platforms such as Coach Me Plus, Team Builder, and Athlete Monitoring. So new to the store is the Flex, which is the ultra-portable and lower-price travel version of the coach's favorite gym wear. So just like the gym wear, the Flex measures the shape of each rep, range of motion, total work done, eccentric dynamics. So for this and the gym wear, this is the advantage that a force plate would have over just knowing how high you jumped. You're getting many other metrics and information that go into this unit of work. Compared to similar portable bar speed monitors, this unit gets the entire rep rather than a fraction. So you have here two awesome tools. And if you're interested in upping your game in the velocity-based training and bar speed world, I would definitely recommend heading to the store at simplyfaster.com and checking into these two units. All right, let's get back to the show. Yeah, I, I will say it is interesting. Sports, that this is probably a rabbit trail, so I won't say much to it, but the, the power of necessity and making do. And I'm sure there's sometimes there's some really good things that can happen as a result of that. But when that's such a large pro- um, c- proportion of the season <laughs> that you're not doing specific work like eventually that's definitely not going to be optimal it's i wonder if they kind of carry that the the in the rationalization of this is what we need to be doing if some of that like oh this is the necessity and that like kind of tough tough it out be inventive type thing maybe stuck with them too but yeah clearly the specificity has to be there I, that's interesting you brought up Derek as well i was actually uh, he's been on the show a couple times. I was actually just thinking about the bonder chuck system this past week myself, because I've been um, I've been down the rabbit hole of a, a GPP style training where you're you're only supposed to do for the most. I might be butchering this because I'm this is secondhand hearing it, but Jay Schrader's work where you do like a five minute ISO lunch hold eleven times a week, so twice a day, eleven times a week, and I'm not, I don't even know how long you do it for. Maybe four or five, six weeks, and then you deload and. I apparently the you know the energetic results can be really good, but I have a really hard time with that because I want to do other stuff. I want to throw more noise in it. I'm like this this experiment isn't going to work for me unless I <laughs> unless I take out the noise so I can give it a fair shake because I always want to do something else. And I I think that one of the things I was thinking about as you were talking, and I'm curious on your take on this is that a lot of sports systems uh, have a separate strength coach than a than the sport coach, and I think that it's probably more common in um, like individual sports or the non-noisy sports for the sport coach to do it all to be the the high performance manager if you will but once you get more into the team sports way less so how what are some thoughts on reducing the noise in in that the high performance system you know where it's different cooks yeah. in the soup and stuff like that oh yeah i mean i think you know my uh yeah, i've got i've got a couple of uh, good friends who've also uh been been speaking to this a bit recently like Stu mcmillan who's the ceo of altus he did a podcast recently and, and, and kind of spoke to this idea. Uh, uh, and, and he, he and I have both talked a lot about it because of inspiration we got from a guy named Dr. Jeremy Shepard, who's, um, a Canadian who lived in Australia for many, many years and then moved from Australia back to Canada. And, uh, Jeremy will always say that you are your, your role, what you do is a servant to the purpose. And so the purpose, you know, is, you know, let's say that you are um, uh, an NCAA division one strength coach working with track and field athletes, you know, the purpose is to get, get the athlete on the podium, healthy and safe. Like that's essentially what the value proposition is. And, you know, Jeremy will often say that the second you confuse your role with the purpose, um, all bets are off. So if I ask a strength coach, what's your purpose? And they say, my, my purpose is to get the athlete as strong as possible and to make sure that they've got, you know, strong as possible, improve their maximal power, improve the rate of force development. Um, right away, they're confusing their role in the picture with what the real purpose is. The purpose is to get them on the podium healthy and safe. And as a strength coach, you may contribute a lot or a little to that piece. And, um, 
certainly when I start talking about this, it's, it's pretty clear. Like there's, there are many paths to Rome here, right? Like there's not, there's not a single accepted one size fits all way to train and develop an athlete. I mean, that's just the reality. And we would be foolish to not view the human as a complex adaptive system that is influenced by how they exchange energy with their environment and the, you know, the, the constraints that are imposed by their environments. And certainly that if I take an athlete who's used to, let's say, a non-noisy form of training and transplant them into a completely different environment and t- or take a coach in one from one environment and transplant them into another, there's a massive effect beyond just the physiology and biomechanics about just the social dynamic of the new training that you're in. And we'd be, I think, you know, I think we'd be foolish to not, to not, to not admit that, but where, where it all becomes problematic in my mind is that you've got a coach, a strength coach who gets dropped into a new system or a new program, you know, first and foremost, you're understanding the culture, right? So we, we deal this a lot with a lot at our our Olympic training center. I work at the Canadian sport Institute Calgary, which is one of four Olympic training centers in Canada. And we do a lot with winter sport. And I can assure you that I can take a speed skater who essentially their whole job is to skate straight, turn left, skate straight, turn left and do that a lot. Um, And I can compare that athlete with, let's say, a snowboarder, right? These snowboarders have come from the mountains. They're they have a totally different culture around what they do. And, you know, they need to be outdoors and doing dynamic things and pushing their limits and testing their skills like that's where they live. You cannot, as a strength coach, come in with the same knowledge and just apply it indiscriminately in both settings. Like you have to understand the culture. If you, if you can't adapt to the culture, you are not going to give those athletes uh, what they need to succeed. And actually, frankly, I don't think as a strength coach, you're going to succeed. Um, you have to have trust, right? Like your athletes at some point have to buy in that you have something to offer. And, you know, I've said this, you know, uh, many times, but you know, I've been doing this a long, well, relatively long time. I started, you know, way, way back in the day working under Charles Pollockin, who's a Canadian strength coach that many of you know, he was the strength coach around here when I started off and I did a lot of sort of freelancing and side work for him. Um, but going back to those days, like, you know, if you're, if you don't have trust, you can't, you can't, um, you can't have impact. And, and even today, after all the experience I could gather, if I'm working with a new athlete who's 19 years old, who has no idea who I am, who has no idea of context about where I've been and what I've done and, and, and what you know, my experience is, they don't trust me. Like that, that's just the full stop. Like I'm just another person in there trying to tell them what to do. So uh, back to your question is I think, you know, for strength coaches who are working in these environments, you got to build trust and you got to build trust, not only with the athlete, but also with the coaches that you're trying to help. And, you know, that trust takes a long time to build because the coaches have to believe that you're there to be able to support their vision. And so as a strength coach who I would be always working inside other coaches programs, whether it's an alpine skiing or a cross country skiing or speed skating, I was constantly trying to understand what's the recipe that this coach is trying to create here. What's the meal and how can I plug in with my area of expertise in the right way to give them that one sliver of knowledge and expertise in the areas maybe that they're not totally up to speed on, but it complements what they're doing. So the key to me is complement, right? Like you have to complement a system and complementing a system because there's not one way to do it. You've got to really be in that mo- mo- mindset of seeking to understand what a coach's system is and how you're going to fit into that to add value. And, and that comes back to the idea of being able to know the purpose versus your role. Because if I come in, I'm like, well, hey, it doesn't matter whether I'm with the snowboarder or the speed skater or the uh, cross country ski coach. My, my, my purpose is to make people strong. I'm going to blow it up a hundred percent of the time. So, um, I think it is a, it's an interesting, it's an interesting dynamic because that doesn't happen frequently in track and field. Like coaches have all say, uh, but I, I do think it can work and I think it can work because you can't expect a coach to know everything about everything. Like it's just too much around performance. The coach has to be able to integrate it. But I think importantly, um, we often talk that, you know, you need good leadership and, and good leadership is obviously, you know, no doubt a, a skill set. But in this case, you need to be a good follower and good followership as a strength coach with a Ph.D. or a master's is understanding that you're the servant to the purpose and you're the servant to the system. And you're there to seek to understand and fit inside what that system is, not to try and make it your own. 
And, uh, you know, I think uh, that's at least some of the things that have helped me kind of navigate those waters uh, over my career. Yeah, I def- you're definitely the servant to a system is such a great phrase. And I, I think about this sometimes in the sense of, I I mean, myself, as well as many other strength coaches, we, we love training, we love improving one at maxes or jumping higher or running faster. And, and those things are great. But it's when you actually get into the the nuts and bolts, and you, you get into the thick of a, a complementary role, those things still exist, but it's it's different. It, it's 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 a support service is a little bit different, and 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 knowing and also having worked in, as a track coach myself, and then having been a strength coach in both roles, it's a very different flavor to it. And I think it's oftentimes it ends up being a little bit different than what we thought it was going to be when we got into it. And yeah, it's 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 really good things to think about it, especially the the way the complementary role ends up shaping it. Yeah, and you know it's it's important too. Like I I. I can remember starting with alpine skiing back after the Vancouver Olympic Games. So I I, I, I went back to uh, back to working with the alpine ski team, and I can remember being in a meeting. We were probably about 2011 ish, and I can remember driving up to the mountains because where I live at the Olympic Training Center in Calgary, we're about an hour and a half from the Rocky Mountains. So drive hour and a half west, and you're in the in the great expanse of of, of wilderness and, and mountain territory. Um, I can remember going up to a lodge to have a meeting with the coaches and this was probably in October, November. And I walked in with um, a pretty clear idea about what I wanted to communicate to them about how our plan needed to look the next summer and, and what we needed to do if we wanted to have success, because at this time we weren't really where we needed to be. And I walked in as a sports scientist and a strength coach who'd had great expertise with, you know, speed skating and cross country skiing and Alpine previously and all, you know, all kinds of things I was going to list off to build credibility and knowledge. You know, I was like, Hey, you know, we've you know, this is the monitoring we're going to do. This is how we're going to do this. And, 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 you know, coming in there thinking that these coaches were going to be like, Oh, this guy's great. You know, we got to do it. Honest to God, I got sworn at. I, I mm-hmm. gave my pitch and coaches, one coach, I remember distinctly saying, we don't give an F what you have to say about this. We don't care. We want the athletes to show up in September, October on snow, ready to go. And I, we do not care what you're doing in the summer. And then the, the lead of the program said, listen, Matt, you're overthinking this. Just make it fun. You know, do something in the summer, make it fun, make it activities, like, you know, do like kayaking, I don't know, and just like random activities. He's telling me, he's like, yeah, it's just it's all you need. And honest to God, I was like, that is not how I see performance. When I look at performance, I like for me, training isn't fun. Like winning is fun. Like that's where you're like, wow, that was worth it. I've never seen a Canadian or a, I've never seen an Olympic medalist stand on top of the podium and then afterwards come off and say, well, that was easy. Like that was, it's hard work and it's, and it's a lot of pain and, 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 and of course it should be enjoyable along the way, but training is tough and training is sacrifice and, and, but you're doing it because you believe in the journey. And the other thing that those um, athletes will almost always say is I couldn't have done this without my team. I've got such a great team of people behind me, my own teammates, my support team, my coach, Nine times out of 10, that's where an athlete's head goes uh, when they've had great success. And so working back in this meeting, I'm like, guys, like, how could you just think that this is totally unimportant? Anyways, you fast forward at this point now, a year and a half later, at this point, some of those coaches have been let go. And and now I've built out um, probably my best and, and one of my best, uh, if not the best and strongest relationship with a, a coach named Tim, Gif- Tim Gefeller. And Tim is now a, a coach over in Norway with the women's team. And, uh, and, and I'm, I'm singling Tim out, but there was the, the whole squad was great. Mental performance, uh, Frank Vandenberg, Jenny Delich, who was our physiotherapist, uh, Jim Pollock, J, uh, Jay Ketty, all these in, people involved, a guy named Hugo Anzermoss, who was the Swiss guy who ran the program and was kind of the manager. But, you know, Tim, Tim really started to trust me just a little bit. And, and, and I started to make sure that he, I, I, to show him, it wasn't about me carving out what I needed to do. It was about me fulfilling his, his vision, his purpose, his design. I'm complimenting his system. I'm not in there to do what I want. I'm in there to help him 
do the things he wants. And when he started seeing me like that, I can remember when he, when he moved to Norway, he was like, Hey man, you know, I don't know that I could have done this without you. Um, uh, in terms of, uh, the, the evolution we'd had with the team. And he'd asked me to come in and to give a, a few pieces of, a, you know, tips of advice to, to the new staff he was working with, which I was happy to do. But, you know, the bigger, the bigger story to me about that whole journey is that even though you're going to have your best foot forward as a strength coach, and you're going to come in there trying to complement the system and do all these things, it takes time to build trust and it takes time to build a relationship. And you are going to have to go back to square one every time you have a new relationship. And, you know, it's, it is hard work and it's not necessarily easy to build that credibility with somebody, but we always have to be putting our best foot forward when we do that. And, um, you know, I, I just think for anyone who's listening out there, who's in that role of being like new to a team, take your time, build your trust. Don't be afraid if people tell you to F off in the meeting the first few times you talk to them, be patient, add value, seek to understand, um, try to think about where you can help complement the system, understand that there's many ways to do things and you're just complementing what's going on because you're serving a bigger purpose. And, uh, you know, the patience to me is really key for anybody out there because it, it really does take that no matter who you are, um, as a, as a, as a provider in that, in that space. Certainly. I, I, I think you said it really well there. And I, in talking about all this and the ways that the sports performance coach can add value, I know you've talked a lot about uh, force plates and jump profiling. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about how jump profiling can fit into complementing what the sport coaches are doing and how you would fit that in um, like the weekly and monthly uh, training models and, and how things might adjust based off that. Well, I think, you know, I think, I think the, the, you know, a couple of key things about this is that, you know, as a strength coach who's curious and who understands that there's a science to what we do, um, I have always in my whole career been on the, you know, been on the war path of trying to bring some science to the practice. And I can tell you that I hit many, many, many uh, um, locked doors and doors that wouldn't open because um, it's hard to do that. Like it's, it's easier, honestly, just to be like, Hey, I'm going to worry about being well-liked. I'm going to worry about giving people what they want. I'm going to worry about making my programs fun and interesting. And I'm going to worry about making sure that my value proposition is the, the buy-in that I get from the athlete. And those are all critical. So don't get me wrong. I just find that incredibly boring. I've always wanted to sort of understand where I'm having impact and why. And, and when we stumbled on these dual force plates, it was really by chance. And I got two of the force plates because one was not big enough. And um, I guess for the first time in my career, I was rehabbing athletes and realizing that if I had them standing on a double, double force plate system, I could measure the force from the right and the left, either in squatting or jumping or deadlifting or whatever, and that that could somehow provide me a qualitative index of how they were recovering as they were coming back from injury. Because at this time, I'm just looking at the curves. But man, was it interesting. It was like, wow, I finally got something that's like giving me enough info that I can actually use it as a coach. And I can actually go back now and try to change something in my programming to see if I change the curves. And, and that's kind of your fundamental of like a, a, a scientific way of thinking is you, you have a, a problem and you come up with, you know, in this case, you know, maybe it's you identify an asymmetry. So you come up with a hypothesis. My hypothesis is that if I prescribe single leg exercise, for example, it's going to change this. And then you have a way that you can use methods that are repeatable. And then you can test whether or not your hypothesis actually worked and, or your hypothesis uh, was, was, uh, was valid. And so, um, you know, that process, you know, the training hypothesis and all these things was really where um, a lot of this stuff showed up for me, but uh, I kind of come back to the important thing about methods is you need to have repeatable tests, reliable tests. And, and one of the nice things about jumping is you can teach almost anybody to do it. Some of our internal data that we've collected now on a, on a data set of well over a hundred athletes that includes athletes who are both developmental level and senior elite level and injured is that we can, we can obtain uh, reliable data with all of those subgroups with good instruction and good data collection methods. And, and that to me is a, a good value proposition for a, a sports scientist or a strength coach is that jumping is that it's, it's a repeatable task that people can do and, and you can measure it uh, with force plates. And so, you know, where, where, the, where the jumping thing fits in first and foremost is that when you're using force plates, it just happens to be a very accurate and precise testing uh, setup. 
uh, jumping is repeatable. We can we can understand what the measurement error is, and we can we can and we can get sufficient reproducibility to make the tests reasonable for our environments. And and from there, the 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 main things that I have been uh, uh, focusing on is number one, uh, back to Derek Evely's, um, uh, uh, uh process with throwers where you're measuring the throw distance. Like, how do you know with an Alpine skier? Like there's not a, there's not that, like there's, there's nothing to quantify in terms of performance. It's really tough actually, uh, to, to kind of pull a number out that says, this is how you're performing today. And, um, I was, um, I was in, uh, um, uh, Ireland a couple of years ago at the European college of sports science conference. And I saw Roger and Oka present, and you guys will know Roger and Oka as probably one of the yeah, and he's one of our senior, most leading experts in neurophysiology, neuromechanics. And I, I talked to Dr. Noka and said, hey, you know, this is this is what I'm trying to do. And, and he was like, yeah, you know what you're trying to do is you're not trying to measure fatigue. You're trying to measure performance fatigability. And he said performance fatigability is the effects of fatigue on performance. And the best way to do that is to have a performance test. And your performance test could be a, a sprint, you know, a, a wing gate. It could be a, a, a sprint on a track or it can be a jump. And so we use the jump as a performance fatigability test so that we can evaluate the reaction to training in terms of performance. Now, obviously this is in terms of things like maximal muscle power and rate of force development. And that's not the only thing that matters for sport. Uh, but the idea of being able to quantify performance fatigability is one big thing that I think I can add value to in that process, because now we have a measure of rate of force development and maximal muscle power via a performance test. And we've got all the other things that I mentioned earlier in, 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 in my, my answer to the question. And we can, we can now use that to sort of detail um, that reaction to training from a neuromuscular standpoint. So that's number one. The other thing with jumping is, is the movement asymmetries. And, and people often think about movement asymmetries sort of like a limb symmetry index, like you'd evaluate strength between sides. It's not what we're trying to capture. We're trying to capture the movement asymmetries that occur in jumping. And it seems like, uh, based on the data that we've presented and others, is that movement asymmetries are sensitive to the injury process. So that if you get hurt, um, you're going to have a change in your movement asymmetry, which tracks, I would say, with expectations in some ways, or with with what we would what, with what we would surmise is occurring as people recover and come back to post injury readiness for return to sport. So that second thing is that we, with a, with a simple dual force plate setup, we now have a, a standardized, uh, repeatable uh, assessment that we can use that can measure interlimb movement asymmetries and jumping. And by getting a baseline over time, in the event that an athlete gets hurt, we now have a, an index to help inform decision-making as that athlete is transitioning back to sport and back to performance. So it's a nice monitoring technique and it's a nice way to inform that process in the event that somebody has has an injury. And, and I think that's the that's the, the second big bin that I would I would say is, is va of value to me. Um, and then the last bin is that, you know, the vertical jump is an expression of, you know, for humans uh, close maximizes nearly our, our our ability for maximal muscle power, roughly. Um, it's a, a movement that that requires a high rate of force development. And, and, uh, because of that, um, we can use the vertical jump as a way to, uh, quantify performance when it comes to things like maximal muscle power, rate of force development, eccentric deceleration ability, vertical jump performance, just in and of itself. And, um, you know, to that end, uh, many of the, of the things that we've looked at for so many years in strength and conditioning, which has been like, I can remember talking to Charles about this. He's like, don't bother with don't bother testing anything other than muscle mass and RM like that. Cause he's, he's like, those number one were the things that we could measure easily, but it was the things that he cared about obviously is, was a, was a big probably driver as well. Um, but you know, I think with, with, with the setup with a jump is you can use the jump and you can break down the jump, the phases of a jump to maybe ask a more granular question about strength abilities. So how do you put on the brakes? Um, what is your rate of force development ability? What is, your um, maximal muscle power ability. Um, how does your vertical jump performance change with load? So across a load continuum, i.e. a force velocity profile. I think these are things that are, that are um, attainable to strength coaches, which add more granularity in terms of being able to quantify your impact, which is that 
you are mo- changing the things that matter as you feed a larger system for this athlete. And, and it's not the end all and be all, but it's certainly a, a good tool that way. So those are three things that I think, you know, the jump and, and jump profiling bring to the table for, for, uh, for our, our world. You're listening to the Just Fly Performance Podcast brought to you by Simply Faster. Good stuff, Matt. I, I love that answer. A lot of layers there. I was like writing down four questions as you went. So maybe I'll just, I know we don't have a lot of time. I'll try to cover the main ones that were in my head. And one was, you, you're talking about Derek and, and Bonderchuk. And and in the Bonderchuk, it's a specific, um, a, a very specific test. How far do you, th- it is your sports skill or whatever skill you're, whether it's a 14 pound shot or 18, whatever skill is being worked on that phase, that's the test. And I know Derek had also mentioned if he was doing um, velocity based training on like a bench press, that that seemed to be correlating pretty closely too with like the shot put, as long as it was really close in the ballpark, what what was in the weight room from a VBT perspective was correlating. I was just wondering if you think you you said the vertical jump and talking with Anoka was a performance um, fatigability. Do you feel like that's fundamentally different in any way than measuring your specific skill over time? Yeah. I mean, certainly like, you know, I think, I think on the, you know, on the hierarchy of, 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 uh, hierarchy of exercise. And this is another thing that I kind of poached from Derek, who I think, uh, adopted from uh, Dr. Bonderchuk, you know, you have at the very top of this hierarchy, the competitive exercise itself, right? Like that's the thing that, you know, as a thrower, it's the thing that matters and it happens to be something that's easy to measure. Um, but, you know, I think to your point is a lot of, a lot of sports, the competitive exercise is just super complex. And the more complex it is, the more backdoor opportunities an athlete has to adapt and to compensate for something that, that is maybe lacking. Like, let's take a really, um, a really, um, extreme example. So competitive exercise, you're, you're, uh, a wide receiver, right. Or a cornerback. Um, And your competitive skill is you've got to be able to change direction, right? To be able to cover your wide receiver. Um, You have uh, torn your ACL and now you're back. It's 24 months post-surgery and you still have pretty crazy deficits in your injured limb. Um, But because you're super experienced, you read the play better and you adapt and you put yourself in better positions and you're able to anticipate plays. So your skill maintains its performance level, not because the contributors of rate of force development and power are necessarily there, but because how you're playing the game has changed. And I think that that's the challenge is that when you get to these complex environments and you move from a competitive exercise, like, um, um, I am a wide receiver or I am a, a, a cornerback to competitive skill. I need to change direction to now all the things that are feeding that as the athlete self organizes to be able to express change of direction ability, um, the challenge is it just gets really, really challenging. Right. And so at the end of the day, I kind of go back to what are some important questions? Like, how do I, um, I, like whenever I present, I often talk about this, um, this documentary I watched, um, uh, on climate change. And when they go back to climate change, um, and they talk about, um, uh, you know, inputs for being able to predict what's happening with our world. Um, this, this particular uh, documentary talked about the use of something called pan evaporation, where they take a pan of water and, and farmers do this all around the world. They put out this pan of water and they measure how much water evaporates in a 24 hour period. It's kind of a reflection of how much sunlight is getting down to the planet. And I always reflected on that because I'm like, wow, that's, you know, you know, for all the millions and millions of dollars of equipment that these climate climate scientists have, it's amazing that pan evaporation, something so simple could potentially be so informative about climate change and about just what's happening. And I was always thinking about that in terms of my, um, my needs as a coach, right? Because would I love to be able to have a, an insole that measures change of direction ability on the field of play, very specifically limb kinematics and kinetics. Yeah, absolutely. In fact, I'm working with a company out of Vancouver called Plantiga that has an insole with an IMU in it. And they're using machine learning to be able to, um, do exactly that measure on field play on field performance with a wearable in a very pragmatic way. But the reality is, um, you know, until that becomes, um, sort of market available, which is they're on their way. It's a pretty amazing actually what they're able to do. Um, 
the reality is as a coach, I don't have that. So I need to go to my pan of operation. And, and honestly, the jump, the jump is just a way for me to understand performance fatigue ability when it comes to the expression of maximal muscle power and rate of force development, because that task requires that quite a bit. And, you know, is, does that matter for your sport? Well, I think it kind of depends on you as a coach, depends on your system, depends on your question, depends on how you see the world. I just know for me as a coach, it's actually an anchor point that I use alongside with monitoring the training load and, you know, some wellness questions. I'm, I'm, I'm quantifying movement asymmetries and vertical jump abilities as just another pan evaporation technique, just to make some sense of the complexities of the athlete in, in, in highly complex sports. It doesn't mean that it provides the end all be all answers. Um, I would disagree. I would, I really try carefully not to let, think people should read into the jump too much. It's just a jump, man. Like, you know, you've been doing it your whole life. You know, I can change your force time curve on a jump just by giving you a couple of cues, whether you use your arms or you don't, or I ask you to unload quick or not, or change your depth. Like these are all things that change jump strategy and jump performance. But at the end of the day, if I just say to the athlete, Hey, listen, pan evaporation, I'm going to do this every Monday after a rest day. You're going to put your hands on your hips. You're going to do five counter movement jumps. And all I want you to do is use whatever technique you want to maximize your jump height. That's it. No other rules, no other constraints. Now I can look into your jump strategy, your jump performance. I can look into these variables and I've got a pan evaporation technique. Certainly pan evaporation doesn't tell you about the whole um, world of climate. That's not the point. It's a simple repeatable test that you can put in your program that could help you answer questions that might be relevant to you. And um, at the end of the day, I, I think that, you know, as, as we move forward through time and, and wearables become more available, which they are, um, Plantigas technologies are increasing rapidly. And it's, it's one of the why, reasons why I like what they're doing is they're using a machine learning approach. It can already recognize whether you're walking, running, or jumping. Um, and it can measure speed in walking and, and, and running. Um, the machine learning algorithms open up a whole other world that now we could probably capture that competitive exercise and that competitive skill in a much more sports specific way. Um, and, and I'm excited for the day when that happens, but I still think there will always be place for, you know, I say to the coaches, what's your pan of operation, find your simple metrics, repeatable over time, stick with them. They help you answer your training hypotheses. They help you guide your decision making. They don't overrule things. They're just inputs that help bring some clarity to a very complex world that we're trying to understand. Yeah, it sounds like I hope I'm not getting this wrong, but is, isn't Occam's razor like the simplest answer is usually the best or something like that? Like or yeah. I, I, maybe it's more complicated than that, but yeah. well, no, I pairing think, things I think down that's the simplest. Of it, right? That we it's the you know that the that the the simp, like that we are trying to reduce our explanations for things down to the simplest explanations. And that to me is that to me is a very, I think it's a good rule to live by, right? Whether you're a minimalist in how you live, um, what's that Netflix documentary? I always Mary Kondo. You know, I've heard that <laughs> expression used. I'm gonna Mary Kondo my kitchen, Mary Kondo my my uh, my closet. You know, Mary. I've once heard a company saying, "I'm gonna Mary Kondo this app." You know, like the idea of simplicity and creating it down to what we really care about, telling beautiful stories with beautiful pictures that are elegantly done and simply done. Um, uh, I think, yeah, I think that's, I think that's the idea to me, right? It's like, you don't have to get, I always say that you're going to be way further ahead if you can find simple things that you can actually do consistently rather than trying to achieve super hard things that are complicated and time consuming. The barriers of complicated and time consuming will get in the way. Keep it simple. Keep it to things that answer the questions that you care about. And, and, uh, and, and do the simple things. Well, I think that's, that's a coaching rule, a sports science rule that, you know, will stand the test of time. It's one of the reasons why I still come back to like, I mean, you know, when I see, when I see people trying to recreate, you know, co super complicated movements in the weight room, trying to achieve this idea of transfer from the gym to the sport, and you've got all these crazy things happening you know, it just doesn't resonate. It's not that it doesn't work. I mean, who knows? Maybe it does work really well. I just think you need to go back to what Derek Eagley said when he got that speed skater, man, I'm just going to start with one thing. I'm going to see how that works. And then when I have a problem, I'm going to add one more thing in. And that's a very different way of thinking that starts simple and adds things in rather than starting super, super noisy and trying to strip stuff out. It's really tough to understand things when you start noisy. So, um, I, I think your Occam's razor, uh, 
uh, analogy or, or parallel, I think is, I think is a great one. Yeah. I think it's, it's definitely been a resonating thing throughout this whole show is reducing the noise. It's just yeah. so often we want to make things way more complicated than they have to be. And we always, we have a lot of shiny things to do that a lot of times. So oh, yeah. It's yeah, a- and I, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm I'm sitting here and I'm just imagining that, you know, some of my coaches that I work with today in sports and they're like, he's saying to keep things simple because, you know, it's, sim- you know, what becomes simple to some people um, or seems simple is not simple to other people. Um, and, you know, I know that when we do, a, for example, our return to sport testing after ACL injuries, we probably have a 25 page report looking at hamstring quadriceps, maximum strength, rate of force development, cross different joint angles, jump asymmetries, both in a squat jump and in a counter movement jump, uh, single leg landings. We look at a fatigue profile over an 80 second jump test. Um, we do anthropometric measurements. We do all this stuff. And I can tell you that when I sit down with an athlete and a coach, that 28 page report is giving me a lot of information that I need because it's helping me decide with that athlete, what our next step's going to be. But it certainly does not seem simple to them. They're like, what the heck? I've never had a 28 page report on me about anything. So I'm kind of conscious when I say, keep it simple. I, I realize that some people could easily judge what I do and be like, man, that looks pretty complicated to me. But the important thing, it's my process, right? Like, the process I'm using to uplift this athlete in the system. In this case, it's, it's, it's supporting that athlete's journey back to sport. And I contribute one little piece to the puzzle, which is how do we optimize your physical abilities along with all my other counterparts on the team to help make sure that this athlete's ready to rock when, when they get back on snow or back wherever Um, it's helping me make sense of the complicatedness of that person and trying to figure out what I'm going to do next. But I certainly understand that that's my process that informs me to help make it simple for them, right? Not that my process is necessarily simple because they might look at it and be like, that doesn't look simple. But um, I do think you're right. It's at the end of the day, you got to take all that stuff, but your process has to be pretty simple and you got to be pretty clear on what you want to accomplish and and not be, um, you know, trying to, trying to do everything because it's impossible to do that. Yeah. Yeah. What you're saying, it just brings me to thinking just, Despite all the ways you can go with this situation with an athlete and all the tests, if I can just think of one thing and start there. And like you said with Derek, I love that. So it's something that's going to stick with me. And yeah, I, I know. I think you're, I, I think you were, our time is just sped up today, but yeah. I, it's, a, that's a good way of, of wrapping everything together and, and, and you know, take, being able to take these complex things, reduce the noise and make it a little simpler. And it's it. good stuff, man. I, I really appreciate all that. Yeah, no, I love it, man. I appreciate the opportunity to chat. It was, this was fun. Thanks for tuning into another show. Appreciate you guys being here with us. If you enjoy this, uh, this episode, this series, this podcast, you can really help us out by heading to iTunes or Stitcher, whatever you're listening to this show on and leaving us a rating or review. Also, don't forget to visit our sponsor, simplyfaster.com, suppliers of high-end training technology. You heard a little bit about the the bar speed monitoring and the flex unit particularly. And in this uh, day and age, I think things like uh, personal personal and, and portable bar speed units are really awesome options. So check that out amongst many other things in their online store. That does it for this week. We will be back next week with another great guest. Have a good one.